Ephesians 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's some pretty powerful scripture right there. All right. The title of this morning's message is POP, P-O-P. Pretty creative, huh? We'll see, see what I'm talking about. I'm a little tired. We got our second puppy in three weeks yesterday. So, so it's, um, I thought I was done raising kids. But it's, um, I get, anyway, middle of the night, puppy pads, grass. I mean, I walked out the other day when it was raining in the middle of the night. Didn't know it was raining. Walked out there, and it was, uh, it was cold rain, too. And um, anyway, it's, we have nine pounds of dog now combined. <laughs> the last one was 2.4 pounds. And um, I left, um, my wife was in bed when I left, and I put the dog in bed with her, and and um, and next thing I know, the dog's on top of her head, just jumping up and down. So, so, so I left quickly, and um, and shut my phone off. And so, so, so we'll find out what happened when I get home. Uh, Psalm one forty eight. John brought up a little bit um, what we're sharing this morning as we go through really a look at the early church and how the early church did church. Okay, how the early church did church. And, um, and we want to take, not exactly everything out of this, but we want to take things that are meaningful, things we can take out of how well, the early church did church and put it into our experience today in our current church. Because we know we live in a post-Christian era. No, no arguments in, in America, not in the whole world, but in America. Um, churches are declining. Churches are closing. Um, there's very little conversion growth going on in America right now. It is in other places of the world. Iran, church is exploding. China, the church is exploding. It's amazing. In America, the church is shrinking. Um, so with that said, um, how do we reach this generation? And that's a big question a lot of people ask. You know, how do you reach the millennials? Because that's the next generation coming up. I know a woman in marketing that works in a major hotel chain, and she was in t tasked with having her, health, her hotel chain reach the millennial generation. And so they, they identified 12 types of millennials, 12 types. So I just said, heck, I'm just going to pick one or two and try to reach them. I don't, I don't know about the, the other ones, but it's just an interesting time to be part of the church. So if we, if we, um, if we live in a post-Christian era, and the early church was born into a non-Christian era, a pre-Christian era, with none of the tools that we have today to build our church, no crusades, no stadiums, no internet, no nothing, just word of mouth, pretty much word of mouth. How did they do it? How did they worship? When I talk about worship, I talk about the whole package, the reading of the scriptures, the preaching of the word, the praise of music, fellowship in the coffee shop before that's all part of our worship the fact you got out of bed this morning and you drove here or somebody drove you here is worship so that's when i it's a very broad term it's how we live our christian life so there's a spiritual discipline 
that I think, unfortunately, can lack in some people's lives, not all. Um, many believers will read their Bible. I, I get up, read my Bible every day. Many of you do that too. And, um, and many will practice the disciplines. Disciplines are reading a Bible, prayer, um, fasting sometimes, solitude. It's a bunch of different spiritual disciplines depending on what book you want to read. But one of the disciplines that sometimes don't get practiced in a Christian's life is that of praise. And, and I look back on my 30-plus years of preaching, and I'm not sure that I've spoken a whole message on this subject, on praise. What's it mean to praise? That's why I titled the message, Pop, The Power of Praise. Pretty cool, huh? And um, so I've, I've learned this in my life in the sense of because I have a distracted mind. I, I, I chase I'm like that dog in Up, that movie Up, that squirrel, and chases the squirrel. That's my, my mind, squirrel, I'm chasing stuff all the time. It's like, put a laser beam in front of me, I'll run around, I'll chase the laser beam. And, and um, so, and when I get up, my mind's racing, I got to do this, I got to do that, I have to do this. And so I start reading the scriptures, and then I, I always have praise music on in our home. We've, that's been there for, you know, since I've been married to Peggy. And, um, and then I just start worshiping God. I'm going to get to the message before I just talk talking about this because I've seen a resurgence of pure praise amongst the younger generation. I want to commend them. There's groups um, in right here in, in the city. We've we had we hosted one here a few months back that get together monthly and weekly. Um, more millennials they get together and from different churches and they just praise. They sing. And they praise God and they worship God for two couple couple hours. It happens every week right here in St. Pete. You can hook up with Cheryl. Cheryl, she'll tell you right. She goes to them all. We've been to the one here. It was it was wonderful. And virtually everyone there is you know they're under thirty years old. So there's a resurgence of praise. Um, and, and again, it looks differently for everybody. Um, there are two hundred and twenty verses in our English Bible. On praise. 115 are in Psalms alone. Just reading the Psalms. The whole Psalms are written as a praise book. Um, in comparison, I love the word grace, but the word grace only appears 130 times in the scriptures. So praise appears 220 times. Here's a good quote. And with that, let me just say there are four or five different Hebrew words that describe it, is inter interpreted in our English, and there are four New Testament words. So there are like probably eight to nine original language words that we bring into our English to mean praise. Here's F.B. Meyer said this, praise is our highest exercise. In prayer, we often approach God for more or less selfish reasons. That's true. In praise, we adore him for what he is in himself. Whoever tired and weary um, you may be, see to it in the morning hour of devotion begins with a key note of thanksgiving, that's huge, in adoration. It's marvelous how this quickens the pulse of the soul. That's a good quote. It was part of the Jewish culture, and it was huge in the early church. The Jewish was a little bit more mechanical in how they praised. If you go to Israel today on the Sabbath, they're dancing around the, the Western Wall and, and um, singing songs and, and spinning and twirling and stuff. It's, it's still part of the fundamental Jewish culture. Psalm 148, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him all you shining stars. Praise him, your highest heavens and your waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. That's his character and nature, the name of the Lord. For he commanded that they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the deep. Fire and hail and snow and mist and stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the 
earth and of all people, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted, and his majesty is above heaven, earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people, praise for, praise for all his saints, and the people of Israel are near to him. Praise the Lord. I guess that was a big deal to them, praising the Lord. So how do we engage this? What's a road map um, to praise? And, what, how the, and the scriptures actually give us that. Now, I'm gonna, this is going to be a little bit of an exhortation message, but I want to teach us because I want to be a church that's known for praise. I want to be a church that's known for biblical literacy, and I think we are. I want, to, I want people to come into our church and feel like they're engaged in a, in, a, in a praise service where they sense the presence of God coming into their lives. I'm going to talk about that. Ephesians 5, verse 18, don't be drunk with wine. It's good advice, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, filled with the Spirit and baptized with the Spirit, two different things. We're baptized once in the Spirit when we're born again. We're filled with the Spirit throughout the day. Um, and sometimes it's probably true we're not, <laughs> but there's other times that we are. We're, we're walking, being filled with the Spirit. But this is how, this is how um, Paul says it works, written from prison singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts, and give thanks, there's that word again, for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in light of these verses, if I drink wine and start feeling happy, it's probably not the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> not the direct ministry of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Spirit on a regular basis, though, and I'm joking, obviously, when I said that, um, should be the chief endeavor of the believer. If I'm filled with the Spirit, I can be led of the Spirit. I diffuse situations. I find God in whatever is confronting me. I have strength when temptation comes because um, I'm practicing being filled with the Spirit. Spirit-filled businessmen. Spirit-filled husbands, spirit-filled wives, spirit-filled friends, whatever your life is, we, make a, we try to make a practice of being spirit-filled throughout the day. So we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs amongst ourselves. That, I would say, is both privately and corporately. I don't have a very good voice, but God likes it. So I sing privately, usually in the morning hours. I'll sing just very quietly so my wife doesn't get mad. And, um, and, and then and here in church, I, I, at least in my mind, I, I'm engaging in the music because psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, it was, it's just how we're wired. God wired us this way. So I, I practice singing these and um, amongst ourselves, both privately and then corporately when we gather together. And we make it a practice. Then we give thanks for everything. Now, this is a big one. And I, I would just say in my own life, if this was um, one thing that ushers me into the presence of God more than something else, is giving thanks. What do you give thanks for? I have some things not to be thankful for. Yes, and we all do. But I look around and I give thanks for the people I love. I give thanks for you. I give thanks for the fact I have a home. I give thanks that my car engine didn't blow up. I, I, I just, you, you give thanks. You look at the blessings you have. I give thanks for, for the um, medical report that came back okay. Or I give thanks that the doctor said it's going to be okay anyway. Does bad things happen? Yeah. But I start giving thanks for what is I'm thankful for. And we all have those things that we're thankful for. We all have a whole bunch of them. And once you start giving thanks and you start listing the things that you give, you're thankful for, um, you find that the presence of God begins just ushering in and 
beginning to take over your mind and your focus starts coming. I remember years and years ago, I've lived in my home since 1983. And um, I moved there as a single guy. I lived in the garage apartment that was there. That's now my master bedroom. I've done a lot of work for the last 30 plus years in there. And, um, and I lived in 260 square foot um, garage. And we had our, our closets were in the side of the corners of the room. I drilled holes in the corners of the room and put shower curtains, not shower curtains, but closet on the side. And we, my wife draped them. So our closets were like, you walked in our room, you saw drapes. That was all our clothes behind there. We had our own bathroom, had a little kitchenette, a little stove about this big. And, um, and it was the little refrigerator. And we lived there for four years. And we were happy as happy could be. And then the pastor of the church, it was a church parsonage at that time, um, um, resigned, and the church voted me in as a pastor in July 1989. And then he, in time, he moved out of the house, and we moved into the regular, the regular big house at that point. And I went from 260 square feet to, at that point, 1,300 square feet. I had no furniture. I had furniture for 260 square feet. <laughs> but it didn't. I, I kept the Christmas tree up in from the window in front of my house till May, just because I didn't have a curtain and couldn't afford it. I didn't want people looking in the window from the street. And and, um, and I would. I remember they had very little furniture. We were buying it piece by piece from Salvation Army. I remember sitting on the floor and just looking across the floor and all this space I had, and just thanking God. God, thank you for my floors. <laughs> thank you I can take more than three steps in my house and and I was so thankful for that house I was so thankful that God had allowed me to live there I was it was like and um I I look back now and I I still thank God for that house not like I did not like I did I got familiar with it like we get familiar with everything but I just but I just thank I still to this day thankful that I have this home that I can call my own I have a place to live. And, um, and thankful that my sins are forgiven. That's a big one, especially if I know what sin is. Thank you, thank you for being, bringing me into the family of God, your family, your adopted son. Thank you, God, for having um, my name written on the Lamb's Book of Life and knowing that the moment I die, I'm going to be in the instant presence of you and Jesus Christ and the, and the people I love have gone on before me. Thank you, God, that you have taken away the, the, the sting of death. Thank you for that. Thank you I don't fear it like I used to as a young person. And you do that for a little while, and you, all of a sudden your heart begins full. And then you, then you begin to praise and you begin to, your heart is getting engaged. You're, you're shutting off, as John said beautifully, shutting off the world, and you're engaging with Jesus Christ. So how does this life of praise happen? First thing we do is preparation. I have to prepare it, be, be, be prepared to a lifestyle of praise. I, I prepare it every morning. I just It's a spiritual discipline that I get up at a certain time, try to, and, um, and under, I'm under no law to do it or anything like that, but I just know for me, if I want to be the husband, I want to be the father, I want to be the friend, I want to be the pastor that I want to be and, and face what I face on a regular basis or, or um, not all bad, just whatever life, um, then I need to be engaged with Jesus Christ. I need to know them. So it's that we, we prepare. Um, when we come to church, and this is a little bit of a challenge for all of us, am I prepared to worship, praise? When I walk in here on a Sunday morning, have I engaged with Jesus Christ before I got here? I hope you did. I hope you did. I hope it's not like, ah, I got a church. Why? You didn't brew the coffee. Ah, I hate traffic lights. I, ah, and I get, and then you come in and, and you try, is, where's God? Oh, he's here. It's not connected just quite yet. So when we have a worship service, and that's why we have a praise part of our service, so you can get engaged with the Holy Spirit. But my prayer is that you prepare, then when you come here, you, you transition from private praise to corporate praise. 
And you practice Ephesians 5, 18 through, through 20 when you get up in the morning. And so when you come amongst the people of God, it becomes natural. Second thing, it's, um, it's a loss of self-consciousness. This is a big one. What oftentimes you'll see me when, when we're singing, I'm sort of like a yo-yo. I'm standing up, praising, then I'm sitting down, then I'm standing up, I'm sitting down, I'm standing up, and I'm sitting down. There's actually a reason for that because I find that when I'm in a, really just in a heart of worship and adoration to God, that the Spirit of God speaks to me, and I add things to my notes throughout the praise service. I finished these notes on Friday, I think, this year. It was week J, something like that. And, um, and then, but then he adds things. He goes, you should say this. You should say that. Or something in the song says, make reference to that. So I'm, I'm in, But if I wasn't engaged in what we're singing, and I wasn't engaged in the prayer ser- praise service, I'm not I'm sure that I would even have the wherewithal to do that. So the loss of self-consciousness, there's a, the author, um, I don't remember his name, I didn't have his name written down, he escapes, um, self con- he descri- describes self-consciousness as one who excessively conscious of his own, one who is excessively conscious of his own self or one's well-being, being conscious of our old nature with its shortcoming and sin rather than being occupied with Christ and the fact that we are a new creature. Self-consciousness. I have a degree in this. I could teach a class on self-consciousness. My wife is a, was a professional ballroom dancer. She's very good back when she danced. She retired when she married me um, by necessity. Um, you would think having a professional ballroom dancer, um, I could dance. Well, I can do a little disco. But but it's um but it, it's um so she's tried to teach me through the years how to do ballroom dance on a waltz and and what happens is I'll do I'll get in this little dance position and we'll we'll do our thing and and then she'll start laughing at me <laughs> every time <laughs> she'll start laughing at me I'll make a mistake which I do every time and she'll start laughing at me so then I quit I'm done I'm done no no don't yeah I'm done you're laughing at me. Why? Because I'm self-conscious. It's just the two of us. I know, but you'll tell somebody. And, um, and, and, um, I'm, and I quit because I, I don't want to look stupid. <laughs> Too late. I already did. And, 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 and um, so I, I, it, that's, what, that's me. I'm wired that way. Some people are not self-conscious at all. I am. Now, interesting account you'll um, in. Second Samuel chapter six, I believe. Uh, it's not right, but you remember when when David brought the ark back from um, Obi Edom's place. When he went there and they they put it there, Obi Edom was was blessed because the ark of the covenant was there. So David the king ushers and leads the worship team as they move the ark back to, into Jerusalem, and he's he's in a, in some sort of a um, non kingly garb, and he 's dancing and he 's singing, and there 's tambourines going on, and it 's quite a procession and, and, and Michelle, Michelle not Michelle, how do you say her name his wife saul 's daughter um, michelle i 'll call her Michelle or Mika how about if i don 't know what her name is it 's an old name anyway and um, and she sees her husband dancing in front of the ark um, and and dressed in this weird outfit singing and twisting and, and twirling, and she, she gets ashamed. She goes, it's shameful that the king of Israel would be seen like this and acting in such a non-self-conscious way. <laughs> and you know, God, um, how I, God um, at that point cursed her with no more children the rest of her life. Because to what David was doing was pleasing to God. God worshipped. God loved the fact that the king of Israel was um, praising him. That the king of Israel was dancing before him. Was it normal? No. Did David do it before? Not that we know of. Did he do it after? Not that I'm aware of. But in that moment of moving the ark into Jerusalem, he was captured in the moment of 
um, praising and worshiping God. Zimbardo, a, um, psycho- a Christian psychologist, calls self-consciousness as a maze of thought highways cluttered with head-on collisions of sensations and noisy traffic jams of frustrated desires. I thought that was great. <laughs> that is so me. <laughs> and um, noisy traffic jams of frustrated desires. We're conscious of ourselves. So we're preoccupied. We get aware of how we look. We're conscious. And I understand. I mean, we don't want to, I mean, I don't want to go out, outside with my hair all messed up. So, so, so I, I, we're, we're conscious of how we look. We're conscious of how we sound when we're singing. I don't want to sing too loud because I can't sing that good. Don't worry. I hear people not singing good all the time. And, um, and it's, it's fine. Just, just sing. If people don't like it, they can move through another pew and they can't hear you sing. Sometimes it's the cares of the world, our world. We come in and we're burdened. We're burdened for whatever. Maybe I did have that bad doctor's report. Maybe I did have the falling out with a friend. Maybe there is a confrontation coming down the road which I don't like and I don't want to be part of. I have a burdened heart. Anything that does not occupy us with Christ um, can distract us from praise. We practice focus. I remember years ago being challenged. Dr. Lewis remembered this and back in Bible college where the pastor and preacher, Pastor Stevens back then, um, challenged us as young people to focus when the word of God was spoke and, and not to be distracted because um, it was easy. If a baby cries, you go like this. And noise over there, you go like that. He says, I want to, he challenged us as a young man to focus and rivet yourself on, on, the, on the speaker and not let, the, not let anything else distract you. And I remember I took that challenge as a young man, and I, and I just sort of, because there was a lot of things. There was a good crowd of people there. There's always something that wants to bring your attention somewhere. But practicing focus, that's going to be the doorway into, into um, praise. I have, like I said, I have these puppies. I take one out to go potty, and a leaf blows by. And next thing I know, he's about to go potty. And, okay, he's going to go, he's going to go, he's going to go. And then the leaf goes by. Ah, he goes chasing the leaf. Oh, man, just, just get over here and go. And, um, and um, he gets distracted. Sometimes we get the same way. We come into prayer, but we get distracted. We're sitting here praising, but then we get distracted. Can people hear me? What do I sound like? I'm not weird, am I? Um, or this is going on. Oh, I got to do that later. Oh, I got to do this. I got to go to Publix on the way home. Um, no, get, get that stuff out of your mind. We come and we engage in worship. A deep sense of awe, and this is about all I'll really share. And this is a big one. John touched upon this in some of the worship service. Awe, if I use that word in the English, if you want to find a good scriptural um, equivalent of the word awe, it would be the word fear in the Bible. When you took the word fear of the Lord, it, it, um, our English doesn't do that any justice because fear speaks like, you know, we think we're afraid of something, we're intimidated. Fear is just awe. I'm, I'm, I'm captured by the awe of who God is. And, um, and I get brought into um, this presence of the majesty of God. Let me read you this Toja quote. The present generation of Christians, and this was written probably 65 years ago, has suffered what I call the lost concept of majesty. This has come by slow decline, decline, manifesting itself in a depreciation of ourselves. Those, excuse me, who hold a low value of man have a corresponding low value of God. After all, God created man in his own image. When we cease to understand the majestic nature of man, we cease to appreciate the majesty of God. How did we get to this place? I thought that was a powerful quote because we understand man, us, we're so finite in our thinking, so we become familiar with the gospel narrative. 
and it loses its wonder. This whole gospel that we, we proclaim and we love in our church, the grace of God, the forgiveness of sins, our standing in Christ. We sang today, is who you are. Then John sang later, show me who you are. Two good prayers, great praise thing. We sang it today. It's who you are. Show me who you are. This is an important piece of, of our worship. If praise is missing, freedom of praise, and the liberty of praise, privately and corporately, we want to relaunch our church in the coming months, and we have a bunch of plans. We're working on a bunch of stuff. We've got a lot of things happening. Praise and worship, um, the praise part of our service is going to be a challenge to us. I know it can be difficult in this particular room because there's probably 75, 80 people here, and, and you have these huge ceilings, and, it's, and noise travels, and it's tough to fill the room up with sound, but that's going to be corrected. And, um, but it's, it's not really about the person next to you. It's not really about the person on the stage. It's not about the words on the screen, even though they may help. It's, are you engaged with Jesus Christ at that moment? And if I'm not, I want to figure out why. Because that's why I've come here, is to engage with Jesus Christ for this hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday morning. And yes, I hope in the, in the morning hours or the evening hours or the afternoon hours, however you manifest your life all through your life, but I just engage my mind. I engage my focus. I engage in who God is, what Jesus Christ has done. This word familiarity is a word we use. Um, we become familiar with the principle that we were saved from sin. Think of that. That's a huge thing. Um, sin's a big word. It's only three letters, but it's a big word. Sin is such a big word that Jesus Christ had to leave heaven because of it. We minimize it. And we actually have probably layers of it. But there are none righteous, no, not one. We said, I've said it a thousand times, if one man could have lived a perfect life in the history of humanity, Jesus never would have died on a cross. It was impossible. God does not look at sin and say, ooh, that's a biggie. Well, that's not too bad. No, because he's so absolutely perfect and so absolutely holy and so absolutely majestic and set up a higher, higher than the heavens that God can't allow one bit of darkness into his presence. Not a bit. If this whole room was white and I took one little black dot, one sin and popped it on the wall, it would be enough to judge humanity forever. So when we mention the word sin, it rolls, because we've been Christianized, um, it rolls off our, our lips pretty easy, but think of it, we are saved from sin. The penalty of sin, the judgment of sin, the grip of sin. I pray for Tim Kelly that that never loses its wonder. I hope I pray for myself that I never lose the, the awe of that. That he calls me one of his own. If you were ever saved from certain death, wouldn't you forever be grateful to that person? If somebody pulled you out of a burning home and saved your life, or a car, or you were drowning, wouldn't you be forever grateful to that person? And the person says, you don't owe me anything. You're not indebted to me. But it just makes us grateful. We would thank and thank and praise and serve those people because we know we have life because of them. One of my favorite authors, David Needham, said, I wonder as the host of heaven looked down on this most special planet 
and observe the children of God, if they are not appalled by the absence of worship, that's the angels, we of all his creatures should be most in awe. We alone have tasted God's grace and forgiveness. We alone have been taken out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And we alone are the bride of the Son of God. That's cool. And we thank God for that. But we know in 1 Peter chapter 1, that is shocking to the angels. I don't know if angels have jealousy, um, but they look, they look at what Jesus Christ did for us and our eternal position forever in heaven as children of God and they're astonished who God is and what he's done keep that before us practice it thank God for it and even if you don't have a heart that seems to be that thankful ask God to give you that heart God I've lost my awe give me my awe back God I've lost the majesty of the gospel. doesn't capture my heart like it used to capture my heart. Will you give me that back? I want my heart to be captured. God, I haven't thanked you for forgiving my sins for months and years. Thank you. Teach me how to thank you and praise you for that. Lord, I haven't had a life of praise, but I want to start a life of praise. Show me through the filling of the Spirit how that happens. Jesus, I pray for our church and I pray for myself, this congregation. God, I want to praise you. I want to praise you when I'm driving down the highway, tra crazy traffic. I don't want to be consumed with the cares of the world and the effects of the day and the bad stuff that might have happened or might happen. I want to be consumed with you. God, maybe I have failed in this area of just living a life of praise. Forgive me for that. Because you are absolutely worthy of everything I can ever offer. You're worthy of my service. You're worthy of my time. You're worthy of my gifts. And you're worthy of my praise. Thank you for loving me, forgiving me, and calling me your own. We know we don't deserve it. Bless this message to our hearts. We pray that it would challenge us to up our praise game. And we learn the power of what it means just to worship and adore you. Bless the offering as we give as a symbol of our praise in Jesus name